Okay, so um, hi everyone. Uh, I'm my name is Omola Musa Aroje. Um, I'm an embroidery artist and I'm also a paper artist. Um, I'm I'm a lot of things to be honest. I'm I'm a business student. I am a linguist. I speak French. I speak Russian. I speak a bit of Chinese. Some Edo, which is my mum's language. I have a lot of different interests, but mainly I'm an artist. I um. I own a business called art business called Far East Favorites, which has been around for about a year. And I do art which is inspired by Chinese and Japanese cultures. Um, if you're, I have an Instagram, I have an Etsy. Um, hopefully you can see on my background, um, um, my business name and everything. So if you search that up on Instagram and my name as well, you'll be able to see some of my stuff on there and uh, Etsy as well. So um, yeah, that's that's me basically. I make um, so I make Chinese palace lanterns as my main sort of paper medium. Um, I have my own design of them, and um, I, that's just been an interest of mine for for a very long time. So yeah, that's me. Yep, that's great. And um, myself and Omale met um, through a, a volunteering at Sight Gallery. And we basically uh, got talking about our different, uh, my written practice and Omale's sort of uh, interests with um, paper craft and um, architecture. And out of that and through throughout lockdown, I've been doing these um, exhibition workshops to basically um well primarily to stop myself from going mad but also to explore the um sort of influences of the Bauhaus um in the 21st century and how different people sort of um fundament the fundamentals of their practice have sort of an anchor in um architecture and the different sort of pedagogical processes um, that the Bauhaus have. And paper is one of the main ones that was used by a number of the uh, Bauhaus masters. Um, this may be the opportunity to sort of begin the, um, I prepared a few slides in order to sort of demonstrate that. So strap yourselves in, I'm about to share screen. It may go horribly wrong, but bear with me. Uh, let's have a look. Yep, would you believe it? I can't actually get that up. Um, let's hope that I can. Yeah, so if we go play on that. Uh, yeah, we did do a technical rehearsal, I can assure you. Um, so while I try and figure that out, now would be a very good opportunity to actually go around and have people introduce themselves if they would wish to. So take yourselves off mute. Let's sort of uh, dispense with all of the sort of formality of what a workshop ordinarily is, because I hate all of that. So um, what tends to happen is after I've introduced myself and Omala has done the same. We pick someone and then they introduce themselves and then they pick someone. So Omale, if you pick someone that you don't know and ask them to introduce themselves, if you'd like to, uh, then just to get to get to know what people's practices are and their interest in this workshop would be good to know. All right. Um... Um, if Michael Velikut would be able to introduce himself, that'd be great. Hello, everyone. Nice to see you. Nice to meet you. Uh, I'm Michael Veliket. I'm based in Madison, Wisconsin, here in the U.S. And um, I'm I met Steve and Amelie on Instagram, basically, right? Um, just in the past like couple of weeks. And so I'm a paper. I I just like say I'm a paper enthusiast, but um, and I also make. A lot of sculpture and most of my art is paper based. Um, and so I think how we sort of met each other is I've recently been teaching a lot of workshops online uh, with my detect the different techniques that I do. And recently I taught one that was sort of inspired by some of Joseph Albers um, uh, uh, exercises that he did with his students. 
Um, and just really basic, I just taught a workshop last week that was about the sort of the relationship between form and feeling and just this idea of, you know, it sort of deeply trying to understand a material just through the materiality of it sort of objectively, but then also sort of trying to get a kind of like emotional or kind of like, um, you know, some other kind of intuitive knowledge from it by just like kind of the handling and the perception of it. Uh, and so, um, so I think, I think Emily saw some of the pieces that I made for my workshop. So that's sort of how I, sort of the serendipitous meeting of, 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 of me and the two of you. So, but it's nice to meet all of you and I look forward to, uh, to what's happening. Yeah, and if you could- Oh, I'll pick someone else, sure. I'm gonna pick Alex G because they are right below me. I'll, I'll wave down like that towards you. Uh, <laughs> my name's Alex Gwynn. Uh, I'm a paper engineer and graphic designer and have been for uh, over a decade now. Uh, I don't do anything particularly artistic. I wouldn't say it's very, uh, it's a bit more corporate focused than I think uh, a lot of other people. Uh, I design like paper crafts for companies and things like that. Uh, I've done a lot of work in the education sector, um, whereas right now I'm doing a lot of work for digital uh, events and things like that. Um, and that's about it really. I'm just interested because I, I saw the word paper and I was like, oh, that's my whole thing. I'll, I'll come and see what people are up to. Uh, and Ben. Hello, I'm Ben. Uh, I am not an artist who works in paper, and I worry I'm a little out of my depth here. I, I do have um, some paper in my house, but I cannot, I cannot um, claim to be more advanced than that. Uh, my arts are more in sort of storytelling and entertainment. I am here because I'm curious. Um, and I would be curious to hear from Connor Shields. Hello. Um, yeah, I'm Connor Shields. I'm a sculptor and actually I don't work with paper. I work with um, sort of industrial objects, materials like bricks and scaffolding and sort of juxtapose it with knitting. So this is, <laughs> paper's not my uh, medium. Um, but I do, I enjoy these sessions. I attended them over the first lockdown. Um, and I just like learn about different artist practices each week and then, um, and also sort of learn about how the Bauhaus movement does sort of translate into their practices and into the 21st century. Yeah. Um, Jess? Hi, um, I don't know if you can hear me okay, but I'm just gonna keep my cam, oh, you can, great. I'm just gonna keep my camera off if that's okay. <laughs> I'm just in my dressing gown and if we're being recorded I don't know if anybody wants to see it let alone it be recorded um yeah I I'm not an artist or a paper artist but I work for the museums in Sheffield um and the art gallery uh, Millennium Gallery uh, and our other sites and I've been keeping myself sane through lockdown with lots of online talks and workshops and things like that and really enjoy kind of learning about all sorts of different things so I'm also here um for curiosity and um, also a general interest in Bauhaus as well. There was a um, fantastic exhibition at Nottingham Contemporary, I think last year about all things Bauhaus through the ages, um, you know, spanning the last, each, each kind of room was a different decade and it was really interesting. So I'm here to learn more about all of that. Thank you. Oh, and that I'll pass on to Anna now. Um, um, Anna has messaged stating that um, they are unable to introduce themselves on screen, so that's perfectly fine. I think we may have gone through everybody at this stage. Um, if you haven't introduced yourself, then um, now would be the time to speak up. But if not, then I've figured out the bug with regards to sharing the slides and we can move on. Is that OK with everyone? Oh, um, Anna's actually um, put something in the chat, which I'm guessing that Anna's okay for me to read out. Um, is that okay, Anna? I'm just waiting for a response, just bear with me. But yeah. I think I'm just going to read read this statement, which uh, from Anna, which was um, I met uh, myself Steve recently through Sheffield Creative Guild, uh, and I'm also uh, based in Sheffield. 
uh, and Anna's a sculptor and audience development consultant with a love of paper. So that was the reason for Anna's um, attendance. Is that okay? Um, so yeah, I think that's everyone. Um, a sort of a good mix of people with different uh, sort of disciplines, which is good. <laughs> that's part of the reason for this to sort of have a diverse mix of um, disciplines in order to talk about these things. So without further ado, so this is my desktop. Hopefully I ought to be able to play these slides. Let's get rid of this. Right. There we go. That's better. Can everybody see that is the first thing? <laughs> Either yep. react or wave or shout or tell me. But yeah, I think everybody can see that. Right, that's the first thing sorted. Right, so, so yeah, um, this is what we're gonna be talking about. Uh, yeah, so Joseph Albers, who um, was mentioned previously, um, he was basically uh, one of the masters of the Bauhaus and was um, sort of sparked my interest upon uh, talk, uh, talking with Amale about paper. Um, and um, origami and paper craft, because Joseph Albers throughout his pedagogy actually came up with um, the curved crease, which is a particular type of fold within paper craft and his use of it within um, the pedagogy of uh, the Bauhaus and how he taught with that was really, really interesting and something that I latched on to. Um, so we'll have a look at um, how he used paper um, in order to teach um, his students uh, at the Bauhaus. Um, we'll also look at how the use of paper um, actually went on to inspire uh, the architectural forms of Arie Chiron, who was a um, scul sculptor uh, and architect who was instrumental in um, the development of the white city of Tel Aviv um, at the end of the Second World War, um, and how the sort of simplicity of form that was created in the sort of second phase of the Bauhaus in Dessau um, actually informed his architectural practice right up until um, his latter days in the 1960s. Um, and then we shall continue um, and to sort of have sort of questions opened up about that with regards to modern paper uh, art and practice of all of the people that are here. And hopefully open it up to some broader questions that myself and Omale have been sort of mulling over, which is this division between art and craft that there seems to be within the wider society and how we can seek to undo that and where it comes from, how it sort of manifested itself over time and for me, the fact that the Bauhaus was one of those places where it sought to undo that in the 1920s, but yet through a series of other historical and socioeconomical factors, that division seems to have re-established itself. So yeah, I'd be interested to hear other people's views on that. So yeah, uh, here's the man himself, Joseph Albers, resplendently staring out towards us. Um, and yeah, a little bit more about uh, Joseph Albers. Um, he joined the Bauhaus preliminary course in 1920. Uh, and although he was an accomplished painter, uh, again, he's um, started off working in stained glass. And this is one of my particular favorite pieces of his stained glass work, um, which is in the collection at the um, Joseph and Annie Albers Institute in Connecticut, I think. 
Uh, yeah, Bethany in Connecticut. Sorry, I was just reading my own caption there. Um, but yeah, what are people's thoughts on on that? Uh, unmute yourselves. <laughs> and yeah, I'd be interested to see what people think of the uh, stained glass work of Alba's. Um, Any thoughts on that? Really, sorry. I think it's really, really lovely. Like it kind of has like aqua, like aqua colors, I guess. It's quite nice. Yeah, <laughs> I like it. Any other thoughts? Um, well, if you, if back to like the past slide with them um, about sort of art and craft and the differences between them, um, I do have a bit of an, I, my thoughts on that are that I think they're kind of one and the same. So mm -hmm. I personally believe art is craft, craft is art. They shouldn't, I think they're separated because of kind of stereotypes. Like I've been thinking about the stereotypes um, of art and craft and well, um, art is kind of, I think art is pretty underrated anyways, but um, when people st think of art, they stereotypically think of paint. When you think of craft, they might think of like ch children's activities they do in school, like those kind of crafts. They don't really, I don't think, um, I don't think what art and craft actually is, is appreciated so much. So um, if people would just have, if there was more knowledge in that available, if people were, were um, more educated on that, I suppose maybe we'd all be able to see that actually they can, they can be like one and the same and they're not just, the stereotypes are just kind of maybe perhaps like misplaced knowledge about about art and craft that's that's just what i think anyway yeah yeah i i, I wholeheartedly agree um but yeah are there are there any other thoughts on that uh from other participants i like that it feels like a place either like a map looking downwards or uh, sort of looking on it's very rectangular in the way that works but is is park at the bottom of it the that is the, uh, that, that, that is the title which you'd right. <laughs> I, I omitted i think it's actually a it's it does have this sort of element of topography about it the sort of idea of it being gridded out and i i quite it, that's why it's one of my favorites it's sort of it's very minimalist but it speaks of sort of the sort of d many different shades of green in a really, it has this idea of nature being tamed by the hand of humanity in the sort of gridded out forms, which is something that I quite like. It's sort of that duality between nature and man. But yeah, any other thoughts? Um, you know, I've never seen this piece before. I thank you for sharing it. I, um, you know, when, when I, before I actually even knew anything about Elbers and his work with paper, I mean, of course I only knew the sort of, his kind of iconic work of the nested squares. Mm -hmm. right? um, and, uh, and so it's interesting to see this, you know, I don't, I can date wise, it looks like it must like predate that work that he, his later, the later paintings. Um, and I don't know how, how developed at this point is like his later interest in color is, um, or but it seems like it's about that also, this kind of beautiful interaction of the colors as they sit next to each other. Mm -hmm. um, but with the, and so I was thinking of a couple of things. One, it sort of looks like an, a, a, a Pete Mondrian painting kind of around this time when he's sort of moving in that, I think this is sort of around the same time as those artists. Um, and it also reminds me later his, I think his wife, um, you know, Annie was a, a fiber artist, right, a weaver. And it reminds me of, of some of maybe the patterns that she was weaving. So it sort of makes me think about some overlap that I hadn't thought of so much before in terms of their formal interests in, in some of both, in both of their work. So, yeah. Was just a, of... No, it's all right. There's a, there's a definite sort of um, inference of the De Stiel movement from um, sort of Norway that sort of very stripped down ideas, as you mentioned with Mondrian and the sort of the tessellation um, within the piece, which again was something that the Bauhaus itself 
um, had uh, members of the De Stiel movement uh, visit the Bauhaus and this stage of it in the 19, 1923 up to 1925, less so when the Bauhaus moved to Dessau uh, in, 1920, uh, in 1925 um, to 26. But again, in this early stage, it, uh, the Bauhaus movement was heavily influenced by De Stiel. Um, the two were sort of synonymous uh, um, and could be argued to be one and the same, one borrowed from the other. It was this sort of very dynamic time for the two styles to come together. Um, but yeah, um, unless anybody has anything else that they would wish to say on the piece, I'm just going to move on to the next slide. Anybody else? Right, okay then. So yeah, um, here is Arie Sharon as um, uh, this photograph, I believe was taken in 1925, which was just as he was um, moving along to uh, the Bauhaus in Dessau. And yes, um, an Austro-Hungarian born um, architect but he traveled to Palestine in 1920 to become a member of um, a kibbutz in 1920. Um, he then joined the Bauhaus latterly in 1926 for the winter term, which was just at the time when um, Joseph Albers had been promoted to um, a master professor. So it was just at the time when um, Joseph Albers had been given the job of teaching the preliminary course and he was given at that time free reign in order to use his own pedagogical techniques and it's that stage where paper and the use of it was heavily um, in, was heavily influenced a number of his students. He coined the um, sort of study of materials uh, more than materials and their interactions. So it was very much about fundamentally understanding one material and using that and only that in the production of artworks. So whereas before um, Paul Clay and um, Johannes Itten had wanted people to study the interaction of materials in the production of works. Uh, Joseph Albers was much more about people understanding one material, how it interacted in and of itself with the environment uh, and the space in which it sat. Uh, so yeah, that's... Uh, that use of space and how it can move and how it shapes our thought processes and the interactions of color was something that Joseph Albers uh, was constantly developing throughout his life. And it was something that the form um, was something that he then transferred across uh, to Arie Sharon. But yeah. And here, um, I was very lucky in actually finding this quote by Hannes Beckman, uh, which he wrote in, um, which was actually written down from uh, 1996. Um, it was a, an observation by Albers. Um, so it's basically, he, point, he pointed then at a study of extreme simplicity made by a young Hungarian architect. He simply had taken newspaper and folded it lengthwise so that it was standing up like a folded screen. Um, Josef Albers exp exclaimed to us how well the material was understood and utilized, how folding the, pro the process was natural to paper because it resulted in making a pliable material stiff, so stiff that it could stand up on its smallest part 
and that the paper had lost its tired, lazy appearance. So yes, this, this may be a little bit of artistic license on my part, but I believe that Albers pointed out Sharon, given the fact that Sharon was a Hungarian architect and he was studying architecture at the Bauhaus at this time. So again, this idea of Albers actually taking an active interest in Chiron's study of paper and how Chiron developed through his understanding of materials that then went on to him using that understanding of materiality and of form and the simplicity of form continued into his own architectural practice at a later stage. Does that make sense? <laughs> I feel like I'm sort of clutching at straws and I'm perfectly willing for people to say that this um, sort of length that I've gone to in making these connections is overly tenuous, but I think that there's merit to be had in it. What do people think? So are you basically, are we basically saying that when he mentions a young Hungarian architect, he might be talking about um, Arya Sharon? Is that, is that what you're basically that's, saying? That's what I'm saying. Yeah, okay. I think that that's, I, again, that's the evidence that I have come up with. Other people, may from that think that it's something else but and there were a number of other hungarian uh, architects but not many at the bauhaus least of least of all that were actually under the tutelage of albers and not many of them were actually active within the architecture department at the bauhaus at this time so via a process of elimination i have come up with the fact that these were um that albers is likely to be speaking about sharon during this interaction and that hannes beckman was definitely at the bauhaus at this time this is actually a primary source the other thing is that the image of the um, paper craft that had been taken at all of all of the instances where these images of paper crafts within the Bauhaus are um, not referenced as being um, by a specific artist. They're on they're unlisted or an unknown artist now. Lots of people have said that that's strange because most of the time they would have had an ownership of the material or the work that, that was being produced at the Bauhaus. Now, again, this is only a theory that I am coming up with, but during this time in Dessau was the rise of the sort of Nazi party and the Third Reich. And in order to, uh, the Bauhaus was forced to close by the Nazi party in 1933. And the images and the sort of collection of photographs of these materials would likely have been labeled as um, sort of degenerate art, given the fact that of um, Arya Sharon's Jewish faith. So it's highly likely that Arya Sharon produced most of, in collaboration with others, these paper crafts. And the reason that they were labeled as sort of not to a particular artist 
is, is, odd, is in order to preserve them for posterity. Because had they have been identified as being created by a Jewish artist, they would have been destroyed. So again, this is only a theory. It is something that I have been doing quite a lot of research in, but it is something that I would need a hell of a lot more time in order to fully pull at those threads. But yeah, what do, pe what do people think on that? Um, I just wanted to ask as well about the um, piece that's um, it's in the presentation at the moment. Um, it's I'm, it's really it's really cool. Like it kind of reminds me of some origami that I'd seen before. Is this one of the pieces that we talked about a bit earlier, which was um, um, which was kind of they they weren't allowed to use the students weren't allowed to use scissors or anything to create this. Was it was this one of those pieces? Yes, there were. Uh, well, Albus stated that he didn't want people to use uh, scissors or glue if they could help it. Mm. Um, and most of these were done either with um, sort of cu cuts or tears and various sort of fol folding and tearing. Now, I'll be honest, I'm not entirely sure whether this is one of those structures, um, but because it's very difficult to sort of, given what I've said about the fact that all of these aren't actually attested to a specific artist, but from the sources that I have, um, that I've been reading, which after this, I will sort of share with the participants, the list of the, uh, that I've come up with. But yeah, this is, um, I was actually reading a PhD article about Alba's pedagogy, which I'll share with everybody at the end of the uh, workshop. But it's been really interesting to read the sort of uh, first-hand accounts of um, Hannes Beckman and others that were compiled in this about the fact that it was, you've, oh, you only have the one material to work with. He was quite strict in that. Um, but out of it came these fascinating structures and a real pared down view of materiality and how to distort the space around you based on the materials and the sparsity of the material at your disposal. But yeah, I just think that I just think that is really fascinating, a structure. It is really interesting, yeah. I like it. Yeah. Michael, did you have any comments? Yeah, I, was, I was interested. So the, um, I think that's a super interesting point that I hadn't thought about. You, you brought up about like the, the sort of relationship between the anonymity of this work and their identity, um, their, their Jewish identity. Um, as I, I guess, because in my own sort of research coming, looking specifically for Albers designs for, um, it's true that they, everything that I've always found has always been sort of attributed to just like Albers students, but it's never like a specific individual. Mm -hmm. um, and I've always thought about it, it sort of relates in a way to kind of also the sort of the conversation that you, the, the sort of point you brought up about the relationship of art and craft earlier. And I, cause I always think about, you know, paper craft, so like paper has such a, 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 a sort of a background as just like a sort of like a sketching process, like paper crafting. It's sort of a, a, a step along the path towards a more finished work for most artists. And so I think one of the one of the I know here in the States, at least one of the um, I think one of the things that, you know, sort of where paper sort of one of the reasons it doesn't sort of isn't sort of fully embraced in, in my experience by sort of the, even like the higher craft community uh, is because it has this sort of like um, kind of ephemeral, this, this sort of ephemerality to it, not just as the material, but also in like in, in its function um, as, a, as a sort of a stop towards something else. Um, and so I thought, I, I guess I've always just assumed in some ways that um, I've always just thought that the, 
you know, these kind of an, an anonymous designs were really just sort of students sort of working through things, but not really kind of um, investing with them a kind of importance that they might with like a finished uh, painting or weaving or design for something else. But um, I think I think your point um, about sort of purposely keeping them anonymous is super interesting. I'd never thought of before. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any other points that anybody would like to raise? Um, uh, sorry, go, oh, go on. Uh, as I was just going to say, if I, I, I wasn't expecting uh, it to go like in that direction. Like uh, I follow a lot of paper engineering stuff and I'm very focused on the techniques themselves rather than the artists, other than like the specific view that I happen to be a fan of. But even then those are contemporary artists. So I was kind of listening along and I was like, yeah, wow, that's really interesting. And like, uh, like my, Michael said, um, I kind of just assumed that the reason a lot of these techniques aren't attributed to anyone throughout history is because they're just, they kind of just always been accepted because people use paper as uh, a medium to get to a, a different end goal. Um, mm -hmm. But I think it really brings it home when you say, oh yeah, they probably weren't credited because then it would have all been destroyed. Uh, I hadn't even considered that and that's, that's really interesting. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's definitely something worth that I'd sort of considered. Again, it's it's just I hasten to add that these are all theories, but it's all sort of worth chewing the fat over um, with regards to different reasons and different um, sort of motivations behind the sort of preservation of the works. And again, it's it's it seems to me that they would have wanted to preserve it for posterity um, and for fear that these things would never have seen the light of day if they would have been attributed to a Jewish artist, given the rise of the party in the sort of late 20s and early 30s again it's just it's, it's monstrous thinking about it but yeah anyway let's move let's move on but yeah uh, this is the last slide i just want to sort of highlight if i may if people can remember the previous slide with the sort of graduations in the form there and compare it to these, well, primarily this image um, of the convalescent hospital uh, by Aria Sharon that was built in the 1950s. Um, and again, all of these um, forms were by Aria Sharon that were built uh, between the 50s and 60s in the White City, as it was called, um, in Tel Aviv. Um, at the end of the Second World War, it was, um, there was basically a lot of, well, um, off the back of the uh, atrocities of the Holocaust uh, and the, ins the installment of the um, Jewish state of Israel, um, it was basically a massive architectural endeavor and Aria Sharon was brought on by um, the premier of the new Israel, the new state of Israel, in order to develop new buildings for housing, infrastructure, um, just basic amenities. And going back to a simplicity of form and of Maxim, maximizing the space available. Um, again, it seems evident to me that Aria Sharon returned to his paper studies at the Bauhaus with regards to the repeating units, with regards to the curves, with regards to the way in which the curves um, continued this um, use of the elongated balcony in order to um, alleviate the harsh heat of the sun. 
um, having the sort of incredibly long but shallow here in this image here allows for maximum shade. And again, that's something that he would have known with regards to the interplay of the light in the forms that he was creating in paper that went back to the 1920s. Uh, and again, it's just, to my eye, interesting and obvious that Alba's paper uh, craft and tutelage in paper went on to directly inform the building and architectural practice of Aria Chiron. Um, so yeah, what do people think of these of these buildings and of these forms? Well, they look incredibly futuristic, uh, futuristic for the time, really. Um, just the way the shapes sort of tessellate, how they fit together, and yeah, yeah, they're really. Um, it's quite special to see. Mm -hmm. I just love the the fact that the simplicity of them. It's 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 deceptively simple. But to have this sort of knowledge of form took obviously a lot of work. It seems sort of so, it seems so easy to dismiss the amount of work that went into the understanding of light in these. Uh, in these forms. And I think that that's one of the things that was important with paper, in that paper is, paper, for, forgive me if I'm incorrect with this on my leg, but um, paper is a way of, and the way in which it you move it and interact with it is about sort of shaping the light around it. It's as much about the shadow as it is about the form. Would you say that that's, and other other people are willing to sort of chime in on this, but that's how I understood it. And it's the thing that fascinates me about your work. That it's, it's as much about how light plays around it and through it, as it is about the material itself. Yeah, kind of, you kind of right. I never actually thought about this before, but that is, that is, that is I think that's right, yeah, because especially with, with what I make with the lanterns, it is, um, so oh, I wish I could like show a picture of, of them or something now, but um, they have they have sort of holes in them, like I've punched holes in them to sort of let light through so when they light up, and or I use valum paper, which is like a thin paper so that the light can fit through them. And it is kind of about how light, it is definitely about how light, um, allows the viewer to see to, to see them as well so i never thought about it like that yeah that's an interesting point and mm -hmm. michael is that with your paper crafts is that something that is within your um thought process the sort of interplay of light or is it purely an it a sort of understanding of form no, it's a great it's a great point. I had I've um, I was thinking about it. I think it depends on what the yeah what the technique is, what the paper craft technique. I think with a lot of these, um, with uh, I think the idea of of like creating a form out of a single plane, a more complex form, uh, and not dealing with the surface in any other kind of textural way. That certainly the the and and if and, and if the paper is white, right? Then I think the 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 this kind of play of light and dark is 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 really important to the effect of the work. I think it's a really great point. Um, uh, and I think I think for you know my own work is like highly textural and really kind of detailed and component based. So the light is very important to it. Um, 
but it, you know, just in terms of being able to kind of cast shadows and, and kind of highlight the textures. So I guess I was thinking of like other kinds of sculptural paper art forms, which are more about the kind of volume and form and, and um, in details opposed to these. What's so amazing about these is like, for me, they like, they have this incredible sense of like repetition and, um, and, but they all, they, you know, and they're, they're, they're very sort of shape and line driven but they're still, they still have this kind of spaciousness about them um, when it could just, and I don't think it's only because that they're like white forms. I think it's just because there's this sort of understanding of the kind of relationship between kind of simplicity and complexity that, that um, I think maybe just kind of arose out of continuing to work with this material and kind of investigate it. But, um, yeah, these are beautiful. The one actually reminds me, I think in your advertisement for this lecture, you, I think you posted an image of a particular kind of Albers influenced paper weaving that sort of like curved, like very much like this one bottom piece. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that was basically me. That was a little bit of a tease and it was, I, I did think that they were, the, the two forms are almost identical only ones in paper and ones in concrete. So it's just, again, seeing the, seeing the connect for me just seems obvious. And this is basically me just going, look, look, it's there. I, I'm hoping that other people see it too. But again, uh, as I've said, th these workshops are basically a means for me to not go mad, uh, but also they're, um hoping that other people are as mad as myself so but yeah and with that unless anybody else has anything that they wish to add i was just going to quickly say um particularly what you said about the the paper well the the paper one that you showed earlier and this building having the same feeling to them but you know i didn't really think about the fact that you know paper and concrete are complete opposites in terms of the material and um, but actually, they they do sort of somehow achieve the same the same sort of feeling, and um, I there wasn't really a sort of a point to that. That was just something I wanted to add in. How the this concrete building has the same feeling of this paper, except the paper could just disintegrate essentially. Um, so. Yeah, it's sort of as as was mentioned in the previous um, quote, the fact that the sort of tiredness and stiffness, sorry, the, the tiredness of the paper had been taken away because the paper had been made stiff. By how it had been folded, yeah. And I think that the opposite has been achieved in this image here, in that concrete has been made to look soft. It seems like uh, Aria Chiron has taken what Albers has said and inverted it in this form here. It's, it's interesting how it can be sort of a nod to, but also an extension of that same understanding of materials. And I think that that's why the two have this sort of causal link and a deep understanding of materials and how they go on to inform the space that are created but yeah and that is that with regards to sharing the screen and my slides but we i think that we've got a lot more to discuss with regards to this idea of craft and art. I think we sort of hit upon it and had a little bit of a conversation, but I think that there's definitely some more strings to tug at with that. So um, I think we've, intro we've introduced ourselves and the practices that we have. I'm, again, with regards to my written practice and of doing this, my, I, as I understand it, the sort of, the Bauhaus for me was a place where 
craft and art were one and the same, as Amalé said. It was a place where it was, it wasn't perfect in that the sort of power structures uh, were very much sort of white male centered. Women were, it was notoriously and unnecessarily difficult for women to rise up the ranks within the Bauhaus. And that's something that in the future, I am wanting to address. And one of the reasons why the first one, the first um, co-host of these workshops is Omale, because re-envisioning the Bauhaus for the 21st century, I feel should be female led and needs to be something that, um, it's something that needs addressing, frankly, with regards to the horribly misogynistic undertones that were within the Bauhaus. Mm. But yeah, I just think that, I'm not sure whether because of that or in spite of it, it was a place where art and craft were one. And I'm, what do other people think on that? Were you saying because of, um, because of because of the way the Bauhaus was, or in spite of the way the Bauhaus was, art and craft was one? Is that what you were saying? Yeah, I, th I think that the way in which it was structured mm -hmm. was that of a medieval style idea of a, a journeyman as which again it's difficult to transliterate but the idea was that it was a series of individual workshops all creating something um and the idea is you'd start off at a lower level you'd train for a period of time to become adept to a particular um sort of uh, discipline but you were perfectly willing as a journeyman to go around the different places and the different workshops within the Bauhaus. People were free to move around and to try out things and realize what they were best at. The only problem being that women were told, oh, you can't or you shouldn't work in certain areas because there were women's arts and men's arts and the men could do whatever they liked but women couldn't it seen and it just seems very sort of sludgy and that i think that the structure if we're wanting to like i am reevaluate the bauhaus for the 21st century it needs to be a whole idea of art but not just saying a whole idea of art and it being white and male it needs to be an art that includes everyone and that giving them the power to and the freedom to express whatever it is that they have. Which is part of the reason why I am doing this. I think what you've just said ties really perfectly into my experience with why craft and art are viewed so differently. Uh, in my opinion, one of the main causes for that is misogyny. It's simply that people view crafts as a thing that, you know, a, a woman does from home in between doing the laundry. Crafts is viewed as this um, a feminine thing to, to fill time rather than a serious thing, like a serious hobby or an artist's uh, undertaking. Whereas art is viewed as this very serious, very heady thing, uh, as if the two can't collide. I think when people think of crafts, rather than art, there's this distinction. Uh, one has value, one doesn't. And I think a lot of that just comes from outdated stereotypes about the kind of people who have the time and want to make crafts. And what they picture when they think of crafts is grabbing household items and tying them together to make a Christmas ornament in an afternoon with your kids, mm -hmm. rather than this is a serious investment in time. This is something that is basically art. The only difference is one is on a pedestal and one is on my kitchen countertop. I, I think that's the the main difference. I think what you're saying about how the Bauhaus movement was also misogynistic, needlessly so, um, 
I think we're just seeing like a, a further echo of why these two things are treated so differently. Yeah, and my, I would I would hope that this is a space that I can extend outwards. I think that my, my hope is that this is a place where people feel safe to express themselves and that I, I'm actually, I actually had a little bit of a wobble with regards to what to refer to people as, because even within artistic circles, referring to people as artists, some people don't like to be called artists if they work in crafts. Some people prefer a whole blanket term of creatives but some people think that they don't want to call themselves creatives because what they do is art. And I actually put up a poll on Twitter saying, what should I refer to people as if I'm inviting them to co-host in this uh, workshop environment? Should I refer to them as creatives in a sort of pan global sense i mean i would obviously ask them what they would want to refer to themselves as but just as a vast collection of what to refer to the people as a whole should it be artists or should it be creatives and overwhelmingly people put artists because like me, I see art in the Bauhaus way, which is the whole idea of art, that there's no distinction between different art practices and that it isn't just about applying paint to paper. And I, I'm wondering how that view or my view of art is elitist, whether I'm creating this view of art and pushing it out into the world when actually I should be seeking not to create an echo chamber and actually asking people what they think art is and seeking to bring about change at that smaller level. It's, it's, I have sort of wrestled with that and found it quite difficult. Mm. What do other people, do other people have any thoughts on that? Um, um, yeah, I just want to add, I think like it's definitely a, a semantics problem and all those connotations with the word craft uh, are so negative and like, yeah, I, we've all given different examples here. I think of, you know, like knitting tea cozies sometimes, you know, that kind of, it's got those kind of connotations and it's such a shame. And I, I think where, I wonder if what you're going towards here is, do we even need the word craft? Because is it all ultimately art? And what, what is craft and what is art? And what's actually the difference? Mm -hmm. Other than, you know, this art is in this medium and this craft is in this medium. But really, is it all art? And maybe we could just use that. Yeah, I'd be inclined to agree with that uh, statement. But where do, where do we think the distinction originated? Is it just a sort of misogynistic view of there, there you go, you go and do whatever you need to do in your own time, whereas art is only the realm of men because men historically were the only people that could achieve an education and therefore they could produce high art whereas women could only produce crafts because they weren't learned again it's just this sort of weird there's, there's something unsettling about it but i'm not sure how where it originated from in order to make sure that it can be sort of ex excised and removed 
but then there's also th are, are there anybody i feel like we've sort of said that craft is horrible is there anybody here that thinks that craft as a word and as a movement is something that should be valued and maintained i think there's a merit to craft i think um i think originally it could have been as much as a gender difference a class difference uh because art um is you art is more aesthetic craft is more functional as a, a very basic definition and while the the educated could just seek art and make art for their own aesthetic satisfaction um crafts was making things you actually needed um building a table is craft um i realize there's definitely a crossover so as with almost everything it's an arbitrary distinction um I always like the idea that all words are metaphors because nothing really falls into the categories we put words to. Um, but I feel like craft, there's a, there are reasonable reasons to keep them separate. And I like that within the Bauhaus, there is a sort of combination. There is the, the functional and the aesthetic together. Uh, but I wouldn't want to throw out the idea of the merit of crafts. Yeah, that, that makes sense. I think that the Bauhaus also created things that were wonderfully functional. I mean, I think back to, um, oh, I, I think back to the um, metal workshop being one of the most successful within the Bauhaus. And the, uh, in terms of the sort of repeatability, the functionality, the ties that they um, had with industry, um, that was actually the closest to craft in terms of mass production that the Bauhaus ever got. And ultimately that was the Bauhaus's aim, to create art that was as accessible to as many people as possible. Um, so again, it's, by no means do I think that craft as a thing is bad. I think that the way in which it is divided up as sometimes being lesser in people's minds is what is the issue. The crafts themselves and the processes by which they are created are of merit and of, I would argue, of greater merit because of the fact that it is an art that is ex of a greater ex that's greater accessible if that makes sense i probably garbled my words there but it's something that you can have a craft you can hold it you can sort of it's tangible whereas art for the most part people see art as being behind a velvet rope, sort of to be gawped at by few people. And I think that, again, there has, finding a middle ground where the two are of the same value is w the place where I'd want to sit. I totally agree with that. Yeah, sorry. I totally agree with that. I'd love them for I'd love for them to sort of be seen as equal things. Um, I kind of I wouldn't say craft is like an awful term. I I kind of I kind of personally see myself as an artist as well as a crafter. I, I I like the term crafter because as well as the term artist, I like the term crafter because there's something about it I think which is like it. Um, I don't know, it's, to me, it kind of speaks of originality. Like there's just something about making, when I think of craft, I, I kind of think more so of like making something from nothing or from things around you, which wouldn't order, which wouldn't, which are kind of ordinary, I suppose. Like with paper, for example, I guess that's pretty ordinary or needle and thread, relatively ordinary and just making something amazing out of that is craft, but it's also an art. So I kind of, I kind of like, I like being called, like calling myself a crafter as well. Yeah. 
Yeah. If um, you just hit on the head, like one of the big differences between what people consider craft and art, I think it's accessibility. Like if you go to a bookstore and you're sat between the art section and the craft section, I think the difference is the craft books will contain things that you can do if you have access to the pieces. Whereas it doesn't matter if I have the paints, I can't necessarily create like a, a Van Gogh artwork or, uh, or something like that. I can't necessarily do a Da Vinci, but if I follow the instructions in this book and I have a needle and thread, I could make this adorable hedgehog. So I wonder if there's something to be said about the more accessible something is, the more of a craft it becomes because anyone can do it. But then that also kind of weighs up the needless gatekeeping of the art world and simultaneously how we value things less if more people have access to it, when surely we should be championing making these things more accessible rather than that devaluing them. Yeah, there is, there's the, the idea of facsimile within the art world is sort of an interesting thing to play with. The idea that why is a facsimile of something more or less valued than the actual thing itself? And I think that within craft, the exchange of knowledge is something of value. And that's something that is actually which increases the value in craft. Whereas in art, the more that something is copied, the lesser the value that we heap upon it. So I think that there's this sort of inverse relationship between repeatability and value within craft and art. And quickly, <laughs> Well, not quickly, uh, but before it goes out of my head. Connor, as someone who uses knitting within their practice, do you see, have you ever thought of that as being more craft than art or where does that sit within your head? Like you were saying about them, uh, in particular in relation to the bar house, them being one and the same. And Ben, what you were saying about by definition, you know, there's the functional, you've got craft, which is functional, and you've got art, which is the aesthetic. But I, I think, and there's a lot of artists that do change, and I think that craft can be art in the in the sense that, you know, art can be, I believe art can be anything, you can use any materials. And I think it's just, I think you can take craft and you take the, the, um, the techniques and whatnot. And I think it's just maybe the context of, of place and how you present it. And because like you said, I, I do use craft in my work and maybe it's placing it not always necessarily within the context of an exhibition, but placing it within the context of art. I do believe that craft can be seen as art, but it can still hold its own and, and, and also still be craft. And um, so like, I do think that they can both be the same and on the same level mm. and craft appreciated as an art form as well as something that's practical I think yeah I think it also craft then by that definition stems from something what you maybe do at home as a little activity to something being in the arts and I think it can be a lot broader than that sorry just had a slight um, message from my mother there, but yeah, that's fine. Um, but yeah, really interesting. Uh, I think that it's, it's impressive the sort of idea of this sort of divide that we've sort of understood as being there and how we can all make make ourselves aware of it and seek to undo it or play around with it i think that i've off the back of these conversations i think that i was quite overzealous in wanting to undo it and now i don't think that i am i think that they can coexist i think that i was quite sort of no 
art and craft have to be art and craft and the division between it is wrong and now i think that it isn't wrong it's just two sides of the same coin and they can coexist peacefully and one is the same and the same is one mm. i think that i've just been a little bit sort of wanting to make things fit and they don't have to they can be they could speak for themselves whatever you choose it to be be it art be it craft be it both be it neither it just the form is speaks of itself which is exactly what <laughs> that's quite serendipitous that's exactly what joseph albert zanaria sharon would do it's just the material and all you're doing is understanding the material and perhaps that's how we should think of it that what the the way in which to undo the division between art and craft is just to have an understanding of the material these and days it, sorry go on uh, no i was just saying i i really i totally agree yeah sorry since work and social life and creative things are increasingly in the digital realm, do you suppose people raised today will have the same distinction between art and craft? And how can we understand the material in digital realms where everything is immaterial, but infinitely replicable? Hmm. That's an interesting one. So the idea that materia materiality requires tactile, yeah, materiality requires tactility. And if we're, if that we're not in a position to exchange that tactile sensation, how do we understand the form? It's much more abstract. Yeah. It's, that is a very, very good question for which at this moment in time, I don't have a complete answer. It's something to mull over. I like that one. I like questions to mull over. Um, um, no, please continue. Uh, it's really interesting that you asked that, Ben, actually, because um, thing, I think people have been, people have definitely been thinking about that. For example, I've entered, I've actually entered an embroidery competition and the theme for it is sort of you have to you, it, it's concerning the duality of being on being online being offline and kind of um you have to present in an embroidery in like in in the form of embroidery how how we kind of um, our identities overlap or differ from each other online and offline and i guess it kind of relates to what you're saying with how how we're going to sort of view art or craft or both um in 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 the sort of digital in the sort of digital world and yeah it's just i think people are becoming more aware of the fact that it's um the fact that we are becoming a more digitized society is going to affect how how art is presented how we see it even how we do it and it's just it's quite it's quite interesting to think about yeah I think personally that the accessibility that has been granted from using and adapting to a digital realm will be something that we'll, we'll see a hell of a lot more of in conventional practice and presentations of art in galleries and in other spaces. One of the reasons that I'm doing this is um, by this I mean vision workshops, is to, it was out of necessity the fact that it had to be purely a digital space, but hopefully when I'm in a state to be able to unlock things and move into a physical space, I'll be taking the accessibility um, practices that I learned and transferring them. Whereas before, I don't think that there would have been that knowledge. I wouldn't have had, I wouldn't have sought that out. And that is a failing of mine. I should have, I should, it shouldn't have taken a global pandemic for me to be able to have thought about these accessibility uh, 
this sort of level of accessibility and incorporating it into my own practice. And I think that on the issue of materiality, I think that it's can be, I, I feel immensely privileged in that I have the sense to be able to experience it. And within this digital realm, I'm aware that there are a great many people who do not, this is all that there is, a screen, and that is their view upon the world. So explaining the materiality and finding better ways in order to do that within this workshop setting is something that I'm setting myself to. Realizing that this experience needs to be as rich and fulfilling and as deep as any physical manifestation of that that will happen in the future. And I think that that's something that I would hope that other institutions are thinking about, that they're not just going to forget all of the lessons that they learned from having to transition their practices to purely digital, that they're not just going to go, oh, the shutters are up, we can do what we did before, because it can't be like that, or it shouldn't be like that. We should take the lessons that we've had to learn and incorporate them into our practice moving forward. I think I might have a bit of a unique perspective for Ben's question in regards to digital artwork being replicatable uh, and how accessibility ties into that. Uh, for like the last 10 years, I've been designing my paper crafts and releasing them online, many of them for free uh, as digital files, which of course means that they're entirely accessible uh, and also entirely replicatable with a copy and paste, but therefore also inherently worthless to so many people because of that fact. Um, and I kind of personally, I love that about them. That's one of the reasons I really got into papercraft was that I can just put a file up and someone across the world can download it 500 times to share it with everyone they know. But I had a very interesting and eye-opening experience at the start of the pandemic where these, these designs that had been available for free for you know, literally years, uh, I suddenly moved them onto an online shop uh, just to change the way downloads work. Um, and I just said, hey, I've made all of these free during the pandemic, even though they were already free before. Uh, and suddenly the amount of downloads I got and the amount of interest I got uh, went up by 70% overnight. And then when I came back in the next morning, everything had got about 700 downloads uh, whereas they averaged about one or two a day before that. And so it was adding the pretense of them not being permanently available, gave them instant value to something that hasn't changed at all. And it was a really eye-opening experience. And since then, I've changed the model with which I put things up. Uh, whereas before it would just be, hey, download this, it's free, have fun. I now say, hey, it's free and there's 500 available. And suddenly they have all of this value and people are really desperate to download them. And, and I get emails thanking me and, and all of these things. Their interest has skyrocketed because there's uh, almost a charade of non-accessibility. So people feel like they're getting something exclusive. Uh, and then when it sells out, you know, sells out uh, in quotes, I just put the number back up to 500 and start again. Um, and so I, I think in a perfect world, we wouldn't view things that are accessible with less value because they're replicatable. But I think there's something in our human psyche of this is not accessible to everyone or won't be forever. It's not replicatable forever. There's a limited number, even if that's a completely arbitrary number because it's a digital file. Uh, I think there's just something in our, uh, in our little brains that responds to that and it's like oh there's 500 i need to get it now then mm -hmm. even if it's just a digital file and i could if i chose to just not have that number there yeah i think that it's there's something to be said about our desire for something rare mm -hmm. and i'm not sure what that's what that says about us the fact that we'd prefer something 
that's our own and scarce rather than easily replicatable. Um, oh, Jess has just asked that if people would be happy to share uh, that she'd love to see people's work and uh, if they have social media pages. So at this juncture, we've got about five minutes left before wrapping up. If people have got um, sort of social media uh, or links to websites, uh, if you could pop them in the chat and everybody can have a look at them, um, that would be great. Um, and yeah, I think that uh, we're sort of heading towards the sort of final furlong of our little chat regarding paper, craft, its divisions and what have you. So any final thoughts, Omale? Um, oh, with what with what Alex said, with um, and what you said as well about sort of wanting something valuable, it kind of just takes me back to my marketing classes where we learn about um, we learn about how making things like um, um, making things scarce is will sort of encourage people to want them more or something, and oh, I it kind of. It's kind of gross how people try and exploit that in, but you know, um, it was just, it's just interesting to know. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. Does anybody else have any thoughts on, we're basically talking about capitalism here. Let's be, let's be perfectly honest. <laughs> we, want, we want to pay not a lot for something that's scarce or a lot for something of which there is not a lot of. I think that that's, I think that that's basically how I, I I'm, I'm horrified to think that that's how our brains work, but maybe it is. Maybe that is something inherent to the human condition that we are, we want something rare. We want something that nobody else has. Does anybody else have any thoughts on that? As a sort of, um, I feel I feel like sort of Jerry Springer. That's our final thought for the day. But does does anybody else have any um, any ideas on that? I think we're never going to overcome it as a problem. Uh, I guess that's my final thought, is although I think the world would be a better place if everything was accessible, I think, as you said, under capitalism, we're never going to have have that outcome because none of the systems we have in our lives uh, are targeted towards that outcome. Um, and the fact that even with digital files, just putting the pretense of a lack of availability gives it inherent value. Uh, I think is a perfect example of that. You're basically putting a price tag on static, uh, on thin air, and suddenly it has value, uh, both for the person buying it, but also for you as the artist or creator or, or designer. Uh, and, and as a final thought, just to cover one of the things we talked about earlier in regards to what should people call themselves and how does that impact the way people view them in regards to like, are they a crafter, are they an artist? Uh, the biggest jump in uh, pay that I've ever had in my career was when I stopped calling myself a paper craft designer and I stopped calling myself an artist and I went with the label paper engineer because I think people, even though the job's the exact same, I think when people hear the word engineer, they picture a different person than if you say, I, I make crafts uh, and therefore they inherently value the service you're providing more. Um, I don't know if we're ever going to overcome that, but I think just being aware of it is half the battle. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Um, any other final thoughts? I was just going to say, um, it probably is like a simplistic or maybe kind of like trite answer. Um, but I, I think for me, the kind of question about, um, there's a sort of about like sort of, you know, what, what the work sells for, how it gets out into the world, how I define myself in relation to the work. That's all it's sort of like 
its own thing that's compl that's very much separate from my experience of making. So I try to keep my focus as much as possible on the making part of it, knowing very well that I also have to deal with this other stuff. Um, but that, you know, the, the work for me is like the making is actually the kind of like the through line that keeps it kind of keeps it grounded and keeps me grounded and consistent as myself. Whereas the other stuff, whether I'm identifying as an artist or a crafter, um, in what context the work kind of moves around and that's always shifting and always changing and that's always difficult and totally not fun but um i was you made me think of something alex when um a, 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 a last year i was applying for something and um and it was this sort of like high craft uh award and you know every for, for like they're like woodworkers they're ceramicists they all have like these unique names but for like paper artists it's sort of like you know, or paper crafter, like it's, it just sort of, it, it's sort of light. <laughs> it doesn't have, and so I was talking to some artist friends. I'm like, should I call myself a paperist? Wouldn't that, doesn't that sound, and they're like, no, dude, no, do not call yourself a paperist. <laughs> but then recently I saw there was a publication called Paperist, which I also thought I was like, hey, I was totally ahead of that. But, um, but yeah, I mean, naming all of that, it's, it's a tricky part of it. But like, for me, like just being able to, the work is really like the, what's for me the most important, you know. Anyways, thank you so much for organizing this. It was really nice meeting you all, by the way. Yeah, it's been great. Um, so yeah, I'm just in the process of attempting to find my YouTube channel so that I can share it with everyone. My, there we go. Right. That's why, yeah. So I think with that, unless anybody else has any other uh, final thoughts, anybody? I Speak just want now. to say thanks to everyone. Like it's been a really great evening, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's been really good. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, and yeah, um, this has been Zvishin and I've just popped my YouTube channel on um, in the chat. And again, the recordings will be popped up on YouTube within the next couple of days. I'd say by the weekend, um, I've just got to do a little bit of editing and make sure that the closed captioning works and that the words are all correct. Um, but yeah, um, it's been great. And thank you very much. There should be another Zvishin next month. I'll send out details if people would like them um, across into their email addresses um, and yeah it's been really really fun thank you thanks everyone for attending and have a pleasant evening thanks very much bye, bye everyone bye. thank you